Started this last week, hope to finish it this week, expect to. The wisdom of worship, the wisdom of worship. We mentioned last week, how many of us want to be wise? Yeah, none of us. How many of you want people to think you're dumb and stupid? Nobody, right? Uh, we want people to think that we're wise and we want to make wise decisions so that our lives are properly ordered. And so in the process of that, we ask, where do we get wisdom? And this message tells you exactly where to get wisdom. Uh, and wisdom isn't that difficult to get. I, I love this passage. We're going to stay mostly in the book of Proverbs today. Uh, Proverbs chapter 8 and verses 1 through 4 says, Does not wisdom call out to you? Wisdom's not hard to find. It says, Hey, I'm over here. Come. Do this. Do, don't do that. Do this. That's wisdom. It calls to us all day long, every day. And it's the wisdom of God that calls to us. And then it goes on, this verse goes on to say, and understanding raises her voice to us. I don't know about this passage. Wisdom is personified. And the Bible personifies her as a woman. (laughs) So wisdom comes from the women. Interesting thought, just... Somebody laugh or something, you know. Uh, And he raises her voice. She raises her voice to all mankind. Isn't that interesting? Been a lot of marriages I've been counseling with that I thought, yeah, God, it was the woman who tended to have the wisdom. Not always, but uh, thank God for godly women who have wisdom and share with the rest of us how to live with that wisdom. But again, Does not wisdom call out to us? All kidding aside, God says wisdom is not a difficult thing to get. You just have to realize where it comes from. Uh, She raises her voice to all mankind. Proverbs 1, 7. For the fear of the Lord, that's the reverence of God. The reverence of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge and wisdom. Do you want to know how to be smart? Turn to God. Understanding that God is God and I'm not. Covered that last week. I don't ever suggest to people I'm really wise. But when people say, well, you've made some really wise decisions. By the way, P.S., I've made some dumb ones too. Like most of us. But in making of wise decisions, people say, well, that was a really wise decision. You know where that came from? God. All wisdom comes from God. So the reverence of the Lord, that means to fear him or literally to recognize he's perfect and we're not. He's holy and we're not. The fear of the Lord is the foundation of true knowledge. But fools despise wisdom. They rebel against wisdom. God speaks wisdom into the ears of the foolish And they say, I'm not doing that. I don't care. Go ahead. You know, rebel against the wisdom of God and see what happens. It won't be pretty. You know, as we're looking at the new year, and next week I'm going to start a new series on new things and the new things that God's going to do in this church as well as other places in your lives uh, around and throughout the whole coming new year. That's the theme. Uh, for the new year. And as he does, as we do that, understand that surrendering to the wisdom of God is the most sane and, and, and wise and perfect thing you can do. Go God's way. Hello. <laughs> Go God's way. But fools, I don't want to be foolish, despise the wisdom of God and they despise discipline. They despise fathers and mothers who say, don't do that, do this. And they go right out and do what they're going to do. And they know it's wrong. And they don't care. That is rebellion and that is foolishness. The one prayer more than any other prayer you need to pray over the coming year is, Lord, teach me to hear and to do your wisdom. Teach me to hear and to do your wisdom. Don't let me despise 
discipline and wisdom. Next verse we cover is Proverbs 2 6. For the Lord grants wisdom. Where does it come from? The Lord grants wisdom. If you think you can get wisdom, now you can get knowledge with a four year degree or a graduate degree, you can't get wisdom. Wisdom comes from God. And you know what God says? God says He favors the simple. You think, well, I've got to have an IQ of 150 in order to have wisdom. No, some of the dumbest people I know have an IQ over 140. And they're dumb. You say, why are they dumb? Because they keep making dumb decisions, even though that's not wise. And they're smart people. Got a whole city filled with them. That's called Washington, D.C. Okay. Okay. Settle down. Okay, the wisdom, uh, the Lord grants wisdom, and from God's mouth comes knowledge and understanding. Comes knowledge and understanding. Major theme of this uh, whole, th this series of two weeks is simply this. When it comes to gaining wisdom, when it comes to gaining wisdom, nothing is more critical than joyously acknowledging who and what God is. Nothing is more critical to your being wise and making good decisions and having a life that is filled with the wisdom of the Lord and therefore good benefits. Nothing is more critical than acknowledging who God is and what God is. He is sovereign. Whew. He's sovereign. Starts with that. He created you and me. So when he says, do this, don't do that, when he speaks to you in prayer, when you open up his word, and as his word speaks to you, the wisest thing in the whole world is to do what his word says. And cheerfully and say, yes, Lord. You know what we call that? Worship. Lord, I thank you for how wise you are. For how strong you are in the midst of my weakness. As I go through really tough times, Lord, help me to be strong. You are all strength. I'm all weakness. When you recognize who and what you are without Christ, then you know how to worship God because of who he is and what he is. He's everything. <laughs> In the midst of your sorrow and your pain, he is joy and strength and healing. In the midst of every lack you have in your life, he's the answer to that lack. He is. His very presence brings the answer to your needs. And to joyously accept that and know that means that you've come to know what it is to worship. Because you can't know that without saying, oh God, you're so awesome. And without you, I'm so in trouble, God. Okay? Mm. We need to know who God is and what God is, and that's called worship. Last week, and this is the part we ended with, and we've still got lots of time for this week, the story of the three wise men who came, and I would remind you to be historically correct that the three wise men, though it sure looks good at the manger, didn't come to the manger. The three wise men came to baby Jesus in a house two years after he was born. Two years after, just so we're historically correct. I don't want to burst your image of all the manger scenes you've ever seen, but it was two years later. Uh, and so I, I love that scene. You don't have to take the wise men out because it reminds us there was wise men. But uh, it says, and we read you this whole passage, all 12 verses last week. Wise men arrived from the east, far east. And they were looking for the king of the Jews. And I said to you, one of the reasons you know that they were wise was because they were looking for Yeshua. They were looking for Jesus. And I asked you last week, are you looking for Jesus? You say, well, I've already found him. I'm saved. I mean in the everyday experiences of your life, whether it's handling your finances 
or work or relationships or whatever? Are you looking for Jesus to be honored and glorified in the middle of your life? Because that's what they were doing. They took a two-year trip to find the Messiah. I mean, how many of you know when you're traveling from the Middle East and you're going to the, uh, from the Far East and you're going to the Middle East and you're on camel, that's going to take you a while. They dedicated themselves to looking for Yeshua HaMashiach. That's Jesus, the Messiah, the one who saves us from our sins. And so they were wise because they were looking for Jesus, <laughs> the King of the Jews. And they entered into the house and they saw the child, the child, Yeshua. You know what Yeshua means? Deliverer. Deliverer. I can take you back 30 plus years and I can tell you that Cheryl came home to me when we were in, living in Clarence pastoring at the Portland Congregational Church and our kids were all in school and I was feeling pretty good about life because my kids are in school and we're, we're done with that, you know, five years of their kids are home and everything's a mess and, and uh, I was really excited about that and, and uh, I was literally shampooing the carpet in our living room and I came in and Cheryl said, Hi, hon, I need to talk with you. And I said, well, good, what's up? She said, I think you need to sit down. She, I said, I don't think so. Just tell me. She said, we're expecting. I got to tell you, I was not happy. Because <laughs> uh, I was looking at me and my lack and my everything, you know, as we do. And... Uh, I literally sat down on the wet carpet and didn't know it. And by the time I got up, I was all wet. I went, why am I wet? You know, didn't know. And honestly, some of you have heard this story before. I was mad at God. I thought, i just gotten where I'm comfortable, God. My kids are in school. Life is easy. Things are good. And you got to go and give me a baby, you know. God says, your attitude needs adjustment. You go upstairs to the bedroom and sit down and talk to me. So I did. I went upstairs and I prayed. And I groused at God for a half an hour. I did. I confess. And after that half an hour, God said to me, are you done? Yeah. Now, some of you have been there. Right, Anita? <laughs> are you done? I said, yes, Lord. He said, you shall call his name Yeshua. Yeshua. He said, you've been fussing at me because you didn't have enough money and you didn't have enough strength and you didn't have enough patience. I had no idea how much it would take. <laughs> he said, you call him Joshua. And he said, I will take care of him. And I have to remind myself of that. He's my most difficult child. I'll just put it there. Uh, I have to remind God every now and then, and he, or he reminds me, I'm not sure which, that I'm still the same one who said, you call his name Yeshua. I will deliver. That's what Yeshua or Joshua means. I will deliver. I will deliver. Whew. Yeshua. They were looking for Yeshua. And they found him. And you know what they did when they found him? Again, how do we know they were wise, the three wise men? Because this is what they did. When they found him, they bowed down and they worshipped him. They bowed down and worshipped him. Whew. Wow. A two-year-old infant. What wise man from the, Middle East, or from the Far East comes and bows down and worships at a two-year-old? One who understands that he's Yeshua. He's the deliverer of all of Israel and literally all of the world. And they bowed down and worshipped him. Wise because they worshipped him. Now, new material, lots of time. What, and I just picked three very simple things that worship will do for you in the coming year. Number one, worship will release forgiveness. 
and I do want you to raise your hands with me, and I'll raise mine first. How many of you have a hard time forgiving yourself? Yeah, okay. Worship releases forgiveness. So how do you know that? Well, you go back to Isaiah chapter 6 and uh, verses 1 through 7. And this was the prophet Isaiah uh, who was very pivotal in the Old Testament knowledge of, of who the Messiah would be. And he tells a story here, and the story is this was Isaiah's, or uh, this was the prophet Isaiah's, one of his most difficult times in all of life. He had spent his whole life serving Uzziah the king. And it says, in the year that King Uzziah died, Isaiah the prophet says, I saw the Lord. See, what I'm suggesting to you is that you and I really don't often see the Lord, not as who he really is. We see him as a good buddy. We see him as a provider, as a one-man welfare system. We, we see him as a whole bunch of things. Do you see him as God in your life? And Isaiah said, I saw the Lord for all he was. And the result of him seeing that, and then we've talked about this. We're going to talk some more about it right now. In the year the king Uzziah died, I... Isaiah saw the Lord, and when I saw the Lord, when I understood who he was and who I'm not, Isaiah said about himself, I am a sinful man. This is a prophet of God, one of the most prestigious and powerful prophets of the whole Old Testament. As far as I can remember my Bible history, he has the longest book prophetic book in the whole Old Testament that's a prophetic book. You know, out of all the prophets, and some of them were called minor prophets, not because they, their message wasn't important, but because they were small books. And then there's the major prophets. Out of all the major prophets who wrote big books, Isaiah had the biggest prophetic work. God trusted him with the largest amount of prophetic knowledge in the whole Old Testament. And he says, I'm a sinful man and I am cursed. I am doomed. NLT, New Living Translation. I am cursed. I have seen God. And, and you know, I sometimes half joke with you about it, but it's reality. There is a God. You need to come to understand and I need to come to understand. There is a God and I'm not him. And when you understand you're not God... But you will come to understand who God is, His holiness, His might, His power, His perfection, His purposes for your life, that He breathed life into you. You exist because He gave you life. That God. And Isaiah saw an image of God. And when he saw that image, he said, I'm a sinful man, and I am doomed. What was he saying? There is absolutely nothing I can do about the fact I am unfit to see God or speak with him or talk with him. I'm unfit. And God, your holiness will destroy me if you let it. Because I'm the exact opposite of holiness, I'm unholiness. That's what Isaiah the prophet said. I want you to notice what happened. In the middle of that, God did something. Wasn't that Isaiah did something? All Isaiah did was to recognize reality, which is he's God, he's perfect, he's holy, he's all-powerful, and I'm not. That's all he did. But God then said to the angel, Go take a coal off the altar. Now, the altar is the place of God's holiness. Nothing is more holy than the altar of God. He said, go take a hot burning coal off the altar and touch Isaiah's lips. And in the process, 
Because what's our most evil part of our body? Our mouth. It belays our attitude. It belies our attitude, our self-centeredness, our everything that's wrong with us. Our tongue seems to speak it. <sighs> Amen. Marcia says, mm, yeah, I know. Yeah, we all know, Marcia. <laughs> we all know. Not just you. Our tongue speaks it. And God said to the angel, go get a coal, hot burning coal off the altar of God and touch his lips. And when the, all, the angel did that, look at what God said to him. Look! Now your guilt is removed. Your guilt is gone. Somebody doesn't say an amen. I'm going to come down here and smack you upside the head. <laughs> Do you get that? He said, your guilt is removed. It's gone. Why do we carry around our guilt? When God said, it's gone. It's gone. You should not live in guilt. There is a new book coming out. Thank you for sending it to me, Josh. I fully intend to read it and buy it. I'm going to have to find I think I downloaded it this morning. It's by, maybe your wife put it out there, I don't know. It's by Ted Decker. And it's called The Forgotten Way. Oh, my word, I read some of it yesterday. <gasps> it says the people of God are supposed to be joyous and filled with excitement and powerful. And, and we look at each other and we look at ourselves and go, who, me? Not me. Why? Because we live in the falseness of our guilt and our shame and our sin and fail to recognize it's gone. Josh, I'm going to encourage you. Apparently it was from your wife and not you. I don't know. But I'll tell you what, you and I need to team preach on that throughout this coming year. We really do. It's powerful. Uh, so your guilt is removed when? Not when you get to heaven. Now. And your sins are forgiven. Worship brings Forgiveness. Isaiah said, oh God, I know who I am. I know what I am. And God said, you're forgiven. You're cleansed. Your guilt is gone. Your guilt is gone. If you don't feel sorrowful for the things you've done wrong, there's a question there. How come? You don't understand then the holiness of God. He created us to be holy. And to shine forth His glory. And when you and I do things that don't reflect His glory, that hurts Him. And it reflects badly on our Creator's name and His character. And so when the Holy Spirit says, Gordon, that's wrong. I go like this, oh God, I'm sorry God. I repent are the right words. I repent, God. I repent. And he says, that's all I needed to hear. Your guilt is removed and your sins are gone. And where did that come from? One place when Isaiah the prophet began to bow down and worship God. Worship produces forgiveness. One simple truth. Here's your second simple truth. Worship releases the presence and the power of God within your life. You ever wish God would just come down in the middle of your life and straighten everything out? Be careful what you wish for. <laughs> I'm glad that he's gracious and, and doesn't all do it at once because I don't think we could handle it any more than I, Isaiah could handle it. <clears throat> but the presence and the power of God are released in genuine worship. 
This comes from 2 Chronicles chapter 5 and verses 13 and 14. I'll just tell you the background quickly. The first temple had been destroyed, and now they had rebuilt another temple, and they were ready to inhabit that temple. In fact, I probably read this verse on the Sunday that we dedicated all that was done here in this new building uh, a few months back. Uh, it so reminds me of, of everything new and fresh. And it was right then where the temple was now finished. And it says, after the temple was finished, all the priests, and by the way, Revelation chapter 5 and verse 10 says, you are all priests. You and I will stand around the throne of God and the angels, not you and me, the angels will give praise to God saying, Heavenly Father, you have made them all priests who bring forth your praise. You are a priest. According to Revelation chapter 5 and verse 10, and it says, After all the priests had purified themselves, that's called repentance. We're back to there again. When you see something wrong inside of your heart and you say, God, I know that wasn't right. Just say, God, I'm sorry. I repent of that. Genuinely, God. I'm sorry. Do you know what the word repentance means or what it is in the Greek? It's very simple. The Greek word is metanoia. Would you say that with me? Metanoia. And it literally means this. You're going one direction. You look up. You realize where you're at. And you say, oh, this isn't the right direction. And you make an about face. And you start walking this direction. You're no longer going that direction. That's what repentance needs. People tell me, well, I've repented for my sins. Are you still doing the same dumb stuff? Then you didn't really repent. Because repentance means you're not doing that anymore and you're now going this way. And after all the priests had purified themselves and the Levites and the priests, watch this, they stood together at the altar and they began to sing the high praises of God together. Wow. And what does it say? That, what, what do we call that? First of all, we call that worship. We call that worship. They stood at the altar together in unity. Folks, and you're going to see this in the next one. If you want this church to grow, we've got to continue to stand in unity. And I love the unity that's here right now. We go to a business meeting. The unity of the Lord is there. I, I remember years, 15, 20 years ago, you go to a business meeting and you wondered what you were walking into, council meeting. <sighs> Didn't feel like church at times. In the last 10, 15 years, there's a spirit of unity. We meet together as the missions committee. Nobody's going to make a decision if you don't agree. Trina can tell you. If one person of the missions committee says, I'm not comfortable with the rest of what you're, the rest of you are comfortable with, then we don't make that decision. We wait until there's a spirit of unity and everyone believes that that's God before we do it everyone or we don't do it psalm 133 uh, verse 1 psalm 133 verses 1 through 3 says that where there is unity there god pours out his blessing the only reason there isn't unity in any church is because we're walking in the flesh and not in the spirit hello because if we're all walking in the, in the wisdom of the Holy Spirit, then we're going to look at each other and say, the Holy Spirit just told me this. And you're going to say, that's weird. The Holy Spirit told me the same thing just this morning. We're all going to go, isn't God good? That's what God is doing. That's what he's doing. God won't speak a contradictory thing. He won't tell me one thing. Well, I'm the pastor and I know and God told me this. And then turn around and you say, I don't think that's God. And then I say, well, I'm the pastor. We're doing this. No, it's not God. Whatever it is, that's not God. Do you know what I believe? You know what I believe? That the same Holy Spirit that lives in me is the same Holy Spirit that lives in you. 
And the same Holy Spirit that teaches me is the same Holy Spirit that teaches you. Why don't I fear when I'm, I'm saying in my retirement, I, you know, I feel I'm supposed to turn this over to, uh, to Josh. Why don't I fear that? He's got the same Holy Spirit I've got. It's that simple, folks. If we're listening to God, we're all going to hear the same message. And so they stood together at the altar, and they sang and they played in unison, praising God. What do we call that? Worship. Praising God. And what happened when they praised God? I love this. What happened when they praised God? The Shekinah filled the temple. You say, what in the world is Shekinah? Shekinah is the Hebrew word in the Old Testament. And you'll find they don't translate it in many places. They just leave it Shekinah. Shekinah literally means the all-encompassing, all-powerful glory of God. Everything that God is filled that temple. You know, if you're here today and you're sitting around, and I know a lot of our kids are gone and our adult leaders are gone and they're go down, going down to bless Barb, and that's awesome, and I'm thrilled at that. But we still have a lot of empty seats. If you're concerned about the empty seats, let me tell you something. Worship God, and he will fill this place with his temple, or with his Shekinah. He will fill this temple, and he'll fill this temple with his Shekinah power and glory. I don't seek the power of God to be powerful. I seek the power of God so that I may somehow, and that's my life purpose, so that I may somehow worship God and reflect back to him the glory that is his. He created me. My number one purpose in life is to reflect his glory. If I don't do that, I have failed. It doesn't matter what else I do. I mean, I've seen pastors who think, well, you, you, you know, you've got to build a huge church. You've got to do this. You've got to do that. You've got to do this. All you've got to do is reflect the glory of God, and you will succeed. That's all it takes. Okay? They sang the praises of God in unison, in unity. And the Shekinah glory of God filled the temple. Wow. Filled the temple. Last one. Worship brings evangelism, and these just go hand in hand. The worship of God will fill this place, but look at it this. What's the proof of that? Acts chapter 2. And all the believers, that's you and me, usins and weans, if you're from Pennsylvania, <laughs> All the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teachings and to prayer and a deep sense of awe overcame them. And then it says, if you want to sum that all up into all the listening to the preaching and all of the prayer and all of the singing of praise, sum that all up into what? Worship. Worship. Mm. And they worshiped together. Worshiped together. What was the result of them worshiping together? Watch this. And by the way, it says they did it every day. Every day. Sunday through Saturday. Every day they got together and worshiped and, and listened to the apostles give teachings and whatever. Every day. And the Lord added to their number... King James Version says, such as those who were going to be saved. Or NLT says, the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. Do you know what I've learned through 50 years of ministry? And it's been 50 years. I, it's actually longer than that. But my first year in Bible college, I was a youth pastor of a church. So 50 years of, of pastoring. You know what I've learned? 
I can't save anybody. I can't fill a church. I know pastors who think if you're charismatic enough in personality, you can fill a church. Mm -mm -mm -mm. Only God can fill the tabernacle with his presence. Only God. And folks, in the coming years, if you want this place filled, there's only one place to go. And that is the presence of God. As long as God is comfortable here, people will be comfortable here. Does that make sense? As long as God is comfortable here, people will be comfortable here. Last, I think these are the last two. That was the last thing that God accomplishes this for. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 30. Watch this real quick. God has united you with Christ Jesus. How many of you know you're united with Christ? That's called salvation. Okay. So watch this. And not only did he unite you with Christ, he, God the Father, made him, Christ Jesus, to be what? Wisdom to the prophets. Oh, to the apostles. No, to you. See, I don't feel like I'm very smart. I don't have much wisdom. Do you understand that Christ was made unto you wisdom and all of the wisdom resident within the second person of the Godhead, Jesus Christ, is now in you? You have the mind of Christ, the Apostle Paul wrote. You have the wisdom of the Lord. The question isn't do we have it. The question is, one, do we recognize it? Two, do we listen to it and obey it? Because as long as we say, I'm going to do my own thing, we're going to be in trouble. But if we understand that if we listen to the wisdom of God, His blessings will overflow within our lives. He has made us pure and holy, and He's freed us from sin. So what is the goal of worship? To honor God. It's not to draw attention to me. One of the reasons I stopped worshiping during the prayer time sitting up here in, in that big overstuffed chair, the main reason, and I went down there, was because you don't need to look at me. You need to look at Jesus when you worship. You don't need to look at Larry or, or uh, Josh or John or Carrie or whatever. You need to look at God. And so I go sit down here and worship the way I'm most comfortable worshiping. Okay. The goal of worship is not to honor man, it's to honor God. Last one. You like the smiles? <laughs> basic premise. This is not a scripture, and I close with this basic premise. If wisdom comes from God, and we've established that it did, God speaks wisdom, He is wisdom, if God gives us wisdom and it comes from him and Christ is our best source of wisdom. I just read to you that the Father made the Son, Jesus, unto us wisdom. If he's our best source of wisdom, then why don't we turn to Christ more often? It's kind of like the Ford idea, red, uh, the white light should come on and go, oh yeah, oh this is not a guilt and condemnation message. This is a, wow, this is really simple. If I want life to be better, if I want to be smarter, if I want to be wiser, if I want to be more blessed, then I guess I need to turn to he who is wisdom more often. Because he is wisdom. He's made unto me wisdom. And to worship him more freely. Because the more we release worship to God, the more his presence will fill your temple, let alone this church. Does that make sense? Amen. Folks, that's God's word to us for the end of this year. I'm excited about what he's speaking to us for the next year, but I'm also excited about the fact that he's saying, Gordon, Gordon, just worship. Just worship. Josh asked me one this morning, I said, how was your trip? And he said, great. And he said, how are you? And I said, I'm worshiping God. You know, Amen. well, why are you doing that? Because it's Christmas? No. Because I want the presence of God to explode within my life. I need it. And nothing else will satisfy 
nothing. 